don't know about you all, but I can't stay in one place for too long, so I like to move around a lot. My students were telling me before I came, they're like, remember, Mr. Jack, you have to be charismatic. They want to listen to you if you're not charismatic. I'm like, thanks a lot, guys. Um, so my, I had another student offering last night, how are you going to practice? And I said, I'm not sure. I'm practicing for my dog. They're like, yeah, you're pretty lonely. I said, I know. And they said, well, I've got beanie boos you can use. I said, they said, how many people will be there? I was like, like 700. She goes, I only got like 35. <laughs> so, so much for that. So relate and educate is my philosophy that I like to stay grounded in. And I hope to share with you guys a few reasons as to why. But first, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Dustin Ecker. You already heard enough about me, so we'll move on. Um, I teach in Warren Township right up the road. Actually, I'm on my lunch break right now. <laughs> Let's dig right into the hard truth and things that we cannot control. And I hope that we can be real for a moment, and then we'll talk about the things that we can control. The things that we cannot control, standardized testing. I know all of us hate it, right? But we can't control it. But in this time of year, we get in this mentality, this state of mind to where we feel like we have to cram in every single learning opportunity possible. And this quote, it really resonates with me. I hope it resonates with you as well. It says, standardized testing is swelled and mutated like a creature in one of those old horror movies to the point that it now threatens to swallow our schools whole. Is it, is it true or is it not? The thing is, is that we get so focused on the results of those tests and we have the sense of urgency to cram every single opportunity that we possibly can to review every ounce of content. But we need to have that same sense of urgency to build relationships that mean something to our students to create spaces within our school walls that mean something because despite the fact that the state might try to cram us into this uh, factory where we're producing machines, we know, we educators know better. We know that the students that we're teaching have hearts and we have to connect with those students in order to make a lasting impact. We know that we need a Maslow before they can balloon and so though it's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, we have to make sure that we are slowing down to make sure that our students not only are loved but that they feel loved. So things that we can't control is, is engagement. And it's easy to, to say, oh, no, my students just aren't engaged. But I would like to give you a brief glimpse into our classroom, and it's just a short little clip before we dig into the re remainder of the speech. Go ahead. Question. Use the strategy of your choice. Compare these measurements. Which one is greater? Now, listen. How many inches? R N A N U S. Well, 12 times 3 is 36. I need a Stop. Begin. <laughs> Like, doesn't this seem boring? Yeah. But this is how Mr. Record does it. See this? It's called a factor rainbow. One is hell, so well the rainbow. One time we did a math review with like eggs and you would just crack them on your head if you got every round. And you, if it was a hard boiled, it would, you get five points. If it was not, you would lose five points. He does room transformations basically like, he'll choose a theme, like if it's alien theme, he'll turn it into like <laughs> outer space. So engagement, things that we can control. Um, I absolutely love, if you take a look here, um, Dr. Chris Emden says, we can focus on content and that's fine. We can focus on theories and that's fine, but content and theories with the absence of the magic of teaching and learning means nothing because relationships are indeed everything. And so finding those magical moments does not mean that you transform your room, but you find ways to bring yourself and your passion into your learning space. Because last week, it was really fun. My students walked in, we had a space transformation and it, it took a lot of time, but you'll see later on some of the goofballs that I've had seven, eight years ago came back to help me set it up. And so it's, it becomes more, more feasible with time. But the oohs and the ahs and the excitement made it all worthwhile. When they came in, the whole week was playing around these content. And yes, engagement in our classroom and excitement levels in our classroom stays pretty high normally, but on our transformation weeks, they seem to soar to new levels. And students become even more excited in the engagement boost. And it's an opportunity not only for that, but it's also time to review content and to integrate teamwork opportunities and to overcome obstacles and challenging moments. You see, uh, I try to make sure that the opportunities are presented to my students that not only energize them, but energize me as well. And though it seems pretty elaborate, and I'm a little extra, I'll admit that, um, there are things that we can do on a daily basis to make it work for us, because transformations aren't everybody's thing. So knowing your learners, what gets your students talking and what are they interested in? Last week was the NBA All-Star Game. How can you tie in the dunk contest to this week's lessons? I know you all have kids doing the Renegade right now. 
How can you take the number of views for the Renegade video and tie that in today's math word problems? Finding ways to create content that means something to your students. Creating class challenges, making things into a game, torture the teacher. My students love torture the teacher. We consistently set new goals as a classroom family and when they attain those goals, then they get to torture the teacher. It's literally just that. And so what they choose more often than not is anybody ever heard of being boozled before? It's the absolute worst. Um, if you haven't heard of it, basically it's two jelly, it has a multitude of jelly beans, they all look the same. One might be uh, chocolate pudding, but the other one's canned dog food. You don't know until you eat it. Uh, one might be strawberry smoothie, and the other one's dead fish. And so every time that they earn a torch at the teacher session, the, the room fills with laughter, and that's the last thing is f time to laugh, because nobody wants to be in a place where laughter is not commonplace. In order to engage your students, you also need to make sure that your room is run as a classroom community. It's not a dictatorship. We're a student voice acknowledged in your classroom. Do your students see you as a learner and see you make mistakes and fail and fail again and learn from those mistakes? Because if they see that you value it, then they too will value it and develop more of a growth mindset. Another thing that we can control is relationships. What are we doing on a daily basis to ensure that our students are feeling valued? Because again, what you have in plan book doesn't matter if your first thing that you try to do in the morning is connect with your students. Because even the best written lesson plan can fall flat on its face if you don't take time to connect. If you don't mind, go ahead and play this clip real quick. I think step one to engaging your students and creating an exciting atmosphere is to create relationships. Look at me. So, look at me. I'm really proud of you. You participate more in class, you focus better, your grades have gone up. What was your score on math, like a 237? Yes. There we go. Whoop whoop! You rock! Okay, I'm proud of you. You're going to do awesome things over there. The more relationships you build with your students, the more engaged they're going to be in day in and day out basis. Love you. So I do home visits for my students before the school year starts. Every year I offer it to families. Any opportunity I have to attend a, a sporting event or a baptism or anything outside of the school walls, I just love to do it. He starts like a little relationship with you in kindergarten to try to get to know you so he can start like knowing what you like and stuff so he can start caring about you more until you get to fourth grade. I used to hang out with the wrong people in third grade. I used to get in a lot of trouble and then this year he's really influenced me to hang out with the right people. Mr. Rucker had to support, supports me ever since my mom died on April 5th. Like he kept on talking to me about it, like how I, how it keeps on affecting me and how it is doing. To my, to my heart, so yeah, it's been a rough, tough time, but hey, at least I tried. At least I tried to keep him a cool head. He can be a little hard on you sometimes, but you know, he only does it because you love you. Your NWA scores, I'm gonna check on Miss Merchant later, but I'm pretty sure they're gonna be number one in the district again. So you went from averaging a 68% on like third, beginning of fourth grade work, to a 90.1 for fifth and sixth grade. So, we will have to go ahead and stay true to our incentives. You guys will get to water balloon me probably tomorrow or yeah, Thursday. It looks like he's going to stab me in the face. I promise NWA you it's just goals. death perception is much further away. Did not happen. Um, a few things I want to pull out of that video is Lily talked about, uh, makes a little connection with her when they're in kindergarten. And that's the thing is that when I hear that, I think, she felt seen, she felt valued from the time she was in kindergarten. And it's all too easy for us to sit in our classroom and say, oh, these are my kids, but every kid in that building is your kid and every kid deserves to, be, to feel seen at some point in time of the day. It's not enough to walk down the hallway and smile and nod. So I try to make a conscious effort to learn as many of the kids' names as possible and learn something about them. Because Lily, I, from the time she was little, I knew she loved brownies. And by the time she got to fourth grade, I got my, I got my brownies. But really, I knew something about her, she knew something about me, we made a connection from the start, and those connections pay off in the long run. And then you have um, Tierney, who I can't help but laugh every time, I, I used to hang out with the wrong people, like she's lived for a hundred years. Um, but the thing is, I didn't, I didn't influence her to hang out with the, wrong, with the right people, what I did was I built a relationship with her and helped her to see the values that she had and the, the abilities that she had that she had not yet unlocked. And because of that, her confidence boosted. She didn't see herself as the bad kid that she once thought she was. She saw herself as a valuable part of our learning community. 
and she became a leader in our classroom. She ended up as a finalist in last year's Black History Rap Contest, uh, a step that she never would have wanted to take otherwise. She qualified for our high ability program over at Creston this year. And then there's Jaren, who Jaren talked about, it can be a little hard on you sometimes, which is true, because you, you see you can't set a low bar and expect students to achieve high goals. And so students can pick up a lot on how much you truly believe in them by the types of goals and expectations that you hold for them. Then you have Christopher, which I, like many of you, I'm sure, in my time teaching, have experienced far too many students who have um, gone through the loss of a loved one unexpectedly. And it's what we do during those times of hardship that can make or break a, a child's desire to be in your learning space. Things that you can do to make it feasible. Going beyond the classroom walls, because your lessons won't always be remembered. They won't always remember that math strategy, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. One thing I like to do uh, starting once we're about three weeks in the school year is I'll, when we know each other you know, fairly well, I'll go up and write a student's name on the board and then I'll write a word of encouragement to them and why we appreciate that student. And then students go up and do the very same and they're not going up there and writing like, I like your shoes or you got cool hair. They're, they're finding things that we genuinely appreciate about that person. And what's cool is that after a few months of school, you see a student, I'm back in reading group, and you see a kid get up out of your seat, what are you doing? And they walk up and they grab the, bar, the dry erase marker and they kind of look at you funny and they start writing somebody's name on the board. And of course they don't put the cat back on the marker. Uh, but they write the, name on, they write the name on the board and then they write a note of encouragement and you see what you've been modeling for them, that spreading that kindness, start to tr have the, the ripple effect. And before the end of the day, the student has all these words of affirmation up on the board and we pull together before, we, before the walk out to the buses and we share out why that student's value, we use our catch box, we share out why that student is a valued me member of our, of our learning community. Then you have these goofballs like these guys right here that they call me Uncle Dustin now. Um, they're over at Warren Central and they'll, they'll message me in the summer, hey Uncle Dustin, want to come and get dunked on? Uh, which doesn't happen. And then the young lady on the right who's also over at Warren Central now who, whose mother texted me this summer saying, hey, she's been cooped up in the hospital for the past week and a half and she keeps on asking if you'd be willing to come visit. You see, these are the moments that you realize that your impact is so much greater than a well-prepared lesson. I like to write personal notes to my students, making those connections from the time they walk in. I usually try to do it on a weekly basis uh, the first semester, and then afterwards, you know, we get super busy. But I try to do it bi-weekly, but it's okay because by that point in time, students are doing it as well. And so where, where I might not be doing it for a week, other students are. Last week I had a student who was out for two days, sick, and when she came back, her desk was covered in notes saying, we missed you, we're so glad you're back, we hope you feel better. Yesterday when I dropped my students off at specials, I passed out the notes that I'd written to them, and by the time I finished passing out things for the reading block, I came back to my space, and it was already flowed, flooded with notes of gratitude and appreciation and words of encouragement that you know that we teachers need sometimes too. Finding opportunities to not only develop your students into leaders, but helping them see themselves as leaders. You can't just talk about wanting connections, you have to take the time to build them. It doesn't happen overnight. These are our Room 25 reunions. I try to do them three to four times a year, and they grow every time. We go to places around here in Indianapolis that'll accept us, a big old crew, and you can see the last one on the right um, was this fall. It was about 175 current and former students that came together. Because it's easy to say, I'll always be here for you, I'll always support you, but it's another thing to show the student and their family that you will support them. And although we're busy, I can find three or four nights out of my year to dedicate to making sure that my students know that I will follow them for years to come. The last thing I want to speak to you about is igniting your passion and staying grounded in your why. What are your strengths? Capitalize on them. What makes you happy? What do you love to do? Because if you're bringing you into the classroom, it's going to be a more genuine way and more sustainable way to engage your students and inspire them. Find ways to bring yourself into the classroom so they can not only see who you are and humanize who you are, but that they understand that you are here for the long run. Find moments to create a family-like atmosphere. Go out and pump up your scholars. Find ways to develop into the leaders that they're meant to be. Laugh with them. And remember to relate and then educate. Because you see, again, we can't just come in and go through the motions and expect that our students aren't going to do the very same. We have to do a little bit more than that. We have to be willing to engage our learners, to excite them, to motivate them. We have to find ways to make connections that'll last a lifetime, love with them, 
laugh with them, cry with them, and learn with them. Because you see, the room isn't yours, it isn't all about you. So step back and listen, because kids have stories too. Thank you very much. If you want to play that video for him, you can. This is just our classroom wrap. It's our family wrap. Hey! Hey! Oh, no!